hello everyone. My name is Anna Sjöblom Hallén. I am the CEO of Ectin Research. We are developing cancer therapy against metastasizing urethral bladder cancer. And the company is situated in AstraZeneca's BioVenture Hub in Mundal and was listed on Spotlight stock market last year. It all started with uh, one of the founders having a patient and that patient got a primary tumor in his bladder. That uh, was treated according to standard procedures, but unfortunately the man came back and he had then gotten metastasis in the pelvic area as well as possibly in the lungs. And there was nothing more they could do for the patient. Unfortunately, he also got a parasitic infection uh, and he got treated for that infection. Three months later, the man came back feeling very well. And the founder was astounded because he was not expected to live so many more months. But re-examining the man, they could see that he had actually been relieved from his cancer. And they looked in back to it, the old samples taken previously, and it was shown that he had suffered from a really advanced form of urethral bladder cancer. So it's based on this and a lot of preclinical experiments that we are now then developing something we call MFA370. Short about bladder cancer. It's the fifth most common cancer in Europe and US. And it's standalone in the US, the healthcare costs 2020 was 173 billion US dollars. And the five year survival for these patient groups with metastasizing form of urethral bladder cancer is just 5%. And yearly 200,000 people die of bladder cancer. So there is a clear unmet need out there. The current treatment is, has very limited efficacy in these patients and the uh, potential side effects are really severe. And unfortunately, this then will give the patients very poor quality of life. It's also associated with very frequent and long hospital visits for these patients. This gives rise to high societal costs because there are so much in the e hospital. And this is actually the most expensive cancer to treat. With regard to treatment, when you start to treat these patients, usually you start off with platinum-based chemotherapy if the patients are well enough. Second line is checkpoint inhibitors, and if that doesn't work, you move on to third-line therapy, which is antibody drug conjugates. And this is where we would like to enter as a third-line option. There are versions of patients not being able to tolerate platinum-based chemotherapy, and then if they are well enough, they will get checkpoint inhibitors. And if that doesn't work, you move on then to the antibody drug conjugates. There are also specific subgroups of patients which have specific mutations in their tumors in the FGFR gene, and in the US they can get Balversa, which is an FGFR kinase inhibitor. So we would like to enter as a third line therapy and then after approval in post-marketing studies go for the lower lines of therapy. So how many cases are we talking about? In total for first, second and third line treatment we are talking about 58,100 patients and that is 2020 in, in UK and Europe, uh, the four largest European countries and the US. And out of those it's 8,100, which is third-line patients. These numbers will unfortunately increase by 2030 by 22%. Market potential then, in the same regions, total market 4.23 billion US dollars. And corresponding then for third-line treatment, 616 million US dollars. A number that then will increase from 2020 to by 22% to 769 million US dollars. So we are developing MFA 370 and uh, we find it to be a risk-reduced project. The reason for this is a number of things. I, I, I to show you previously that the start of the whole thing was this uh, one patient case. A lot of preclinical research has gone into this project and we are now developing then this Combinations, combination therapy that MFA370 is. It's a combination of two existing substances. So we're doing a repositioning 
uh, using substances that are out there and used in other indications today, but now for the treatment of cancer. This project is now in clinical phase, being regulatory approved. And then going back to then to the advantages with MFA 370, we will give it as an oral administration as compared to established treatment, which is intravenous treatment. So the patients need to be in hospital currently, also due to the severe side effects that they are having. These substances have excellent safety profiles. That is very good for the patients, of course. And also, uh, as compared to the established treatment, they are really, really good. Uh, scientifically, they are well established. So a um, lot of preclinical as well as clinical e experiments have been done on these substances. So there is a wealth of knowledge that we can tap into in our development, giving us reduced re uh, developmental time, cost, as well as risk. We will reduce the societal cost by using this treatment. The reason for this is that the patients can be in their homes taking this treatment. And as you know, cost for healthcare will be increasingly important in the future. Yes, here is some preclinical data. Uh, it's a cell cultivation experiment um, in urethral bladder cancer. Uh, so the cells are growing. To the left, you see in uh, gray, you have the controls. The cell number is set to 100%. In the following two, we have added one of the components, either an NSAID or an avimectin, and nothing happens. But if you add them together in really small amounts, you see a strong antiproliferative effect. So the cells does not grow to the same extent. And what you also see, if you look in the microscope, is that these cells have gotten a signal that they should die, an apoptotic signal, and this is exactly what you think happened to the patient because the patient's tumor did not just stop growing, they are actually vanished. So, here is the plan of our clinical validation. Uh, it's a plan that we developed together with our full-service CRO, Link Medical Research. And it's a phase one, two study in metastasizing urethral bladder cancer cells. And uh, we are then going to, in the first part, look into safety and tolerability but also to determine recommended phase two dose, that is the dose to use of MFA370 going into phase two. So in the phase two, uh, you can see that we are focused then on studying the clinical effect, and that is to statistically actually prove whether or not we have the clinical effect when using MFA370 in these patients. We have developed this regulatory pathway uh, in close dialogue with regulatory bodies. And we are very happy to say that we have now gotten complete regulatory approval in Sweden, Denmark, Lithuania, and also nearly complete in Germany. <laughs> we have easy approval, CTA approval, and now it's just radiation protection application left. We have negotiated agreements with uh, subcontractors, and we have also associated ourselves with a number of clinical sites for the study. Uh, the board has now decided to postpone the initiation of the study until complemented capital has uh, been secured. So our focus at the moment is actually then this value increasing uh, executional plan. There are three areas. It's the business development, you have the preclinical activities, and well as CMC formulation. In the uh, business development part, we are looking into now negotiations with one identified partner uh, to explore then the different financial options going forward. With regard to the preclinical uh, pre part, we are looking further into the different cancer indications. We are also looking into substance families. And one thing that we could then develop is potentially new patent applications. We are also uh, going into this CMC and formulation part, the third area. And we have very recently, as you may have seen in our press releases, uh, recruited a very senior formulation expert to head the CMC and formulation part for us. And we believe that this will solidify the business case by validating the preclinical data package as well as potentially then expanding the product portfolio. 
And totally then we find that that would increase the incremental value of the company. With regard to patents, we have approved patents in the US, in Europe, Canada and Australia. The patent will lapse 2037 with five-year patent extension, which you usually get. And we have also looked into the freedom of operate, uh, which is confirmed. That is the commercial use of the patent. New potential IP, uh, could, uh, it will be based on ongoing developments. It could be, for example, dosing regime of the patients. It could be regarding biomarkers in order to stratify the patients. Uh, in responders and non-responders, and it could also be regarding the formulation, for example. Other kinds of protection is uh, data protection on registration. Yes, uh, so this is then Ecton's management and board of directors. So apart from myself in the management, I have uh, Chief Medical Officer Austin Smith. He is an oncology with a number of years within oncology and oncology trials. CFO is Michael Owens. He has been working with listed companies and financial reporting for many years. And then our newly recruited director for the technical operations, Dr. Kevin Cassidy. Then to the right, you have uh, the board of directors, headed by Hans-Peter Ostler, who is a board executive. In the center, you have the founders, senior physician Christer Edlund, who had the original patient, and then Professor Merita, Marilus Ivarsson, as well as Associate Professor Peter Falk. They have a research laboratory at Östra Sjukhuset. Och sen, you have Göran Gannadal to the right, industry professional, and Fredrik Andersson, a private investor and entrepreneur, as well as then Anders Vaz, industry professional. Well, let's see if we have any questions for you, Anna. <laughs> Oh, or, or maybe, by all oh. means, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Applaud. <laughs> then questions. You mentioned that you're nearing the approval in, uh, in Germany. Hmm? Do you have any idea of the time scale here, how long it might take before you get this, this approval? It's, it's not a big thing, but it seems to, uh, they seem to have some kind of <laughs> internal issue. Uh, so it's more like uh, local, uh, but it should be a small thing, actually. So, so we're very, very confident that this will, will work. You've submitted everything that you need to submit and now you're just yeah. waiting for them to... Uh, we actually cannot submit. We are lacking a signature. Okay. So that's what we are looking for. And it could be... It's very difficult, obviously. We, are, we have found out the hard way. But it's, uh, we are extremely close. And yeah. when you've chosen this, because you said it's Germany, Sweden, Denmark and Lithuania, why have you chosen these countries to conduct the, the study? Yes, uh, Good question. <laughs> but uh, we actually, uh, from the start, we thought that we were going to do it in, in Sweden. But then for the second part, the phase one, uh, phase two, we wanted to include more countries because then it's more patients we need to include. So we thought it was good to just get going on the, in the other countries too. Uh, but the reason is also, of course, to, to be able to facilitate the patient recruitment. Uh, there are different, um, you know, opportunities in different countries. So it's more like a... a a way to try to mitigate, you know, the potential issue with the patient recruitment. I see. And you, am I correct in saying you expect the study to resume in December? Is that correct? Do you, I'm expecting the, the study, study to... to... When do you expect it to be able to, to start? Yes, that, so uh, the board very recently decided to postpone the initiation of the uh, trial. Uh, because of the need for, for complementing capital. Uh, so that was based on, uh, you know, we tried to do a, a rights issue this uh, in September. And uh, so in and, and that sense, if that had gone through, uh, that then we would have started in December. But uh, due to the market situation, uh, the board decided to cancel this rights issue and explore other options. So that's what we need to do now, explore other options before we initiate the study. And I know this is a question you probably can't answer, but how far along are you in terms of reaching a financial solution? Uh, I mean, it's an ongoing work, so no decisions have been taken. Uh, so it's, it's a bit early for me to say. <laughs> and if we then look at the, um, uh, the competitive situation, because what does that look like? What kind of potential competitors do you see? 
Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the situ- we are offering a monotherapy uh, in the third line. And uh, I mean, the things that are out there is usually that you combine treatments, usually checkpoint inhibitors with something. For example, PADSEV and checkpoint inhibitors are tried uh, and so forth. So usually it's some kind of combination with checkpoint inhibitors. There are some um, FGFR uh, in- inhibitors. I'm, as I mentioned before, there are subgroups of patients with FGFR mutations so that's that is also competition at one actually so but hmm, so well i'm very happy with that answer and thank you so much for your presentation thank you, thank you.